Prepare for the extraction point. We've been briefed on all the important stories and events in the world of emerging information. Now, it's time to extract the data and turn it into action. Live from the SiliconANGLE studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, this is Extraction Point with John Furrier. Okay, we're live back in the Palo Alto studios. I'm John Furrier for the Extraction Point, where we extract the signal from the noise. And my special guest today, I'm excited to have here, is Paul Martino, who is the founder of Aggregate Knowledge and also a storied entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, who now lives in Philly with his family, uh, comes out here. Uh, Paul is known for, among other things, being a great entrepreneur, um, tech geek, loves tech, loves to build, build startups. Um, started one of the first social networks uh, with Mark Pincus called Tribe. Um, started his own company funded by Kleiner Perkins with his partner Chris Law called Aggregate Knowledge, which is booming and doing great. And uh, now more famous for being the uh, first round investor in Zynga, a company mm-hmm. that is exploding with uh, revenue, as Kleiner Perkins said, is the of all their portfolio companies in the history, more than Google's made more money faster than anybody. Paul Martino, welcome to the Extraction Point. Great to see you. John, as always, awesome to see you. Um, first, I got to start with, um, you're now, um, I forgot to mention that you're actually running a venture firm. Um, <laughs> so in addition to being famous for Zynga, you're uh, running Bullpen Capital. So mm-hmm. first, give the folks out there an update and first confirm or deny you were in the first round of Zynga or not. Yes, the, the first round of Zynga, there were several institutional investors and several individual investors. Matt Otko, me, Reed Hoffman were individual investors, Avalon, Union Square, um, Accelerator Ventures, and Foundry were the institutional investors in that first round. Peter Was Peter Thiel? Yeah, Peter was also an individual investor in the first round. So that's officially the first round investors of Zynga. We have clarified that, and uh, that is now on the books. But now you're, you've uh, been successfully founded um, Aggregate Knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, you now have a CEO running that. What's the update with Aggregate Knowledge? Yeah, so a uh, great guy runs that company. It's a guy you need to meet and have on this show, uh, Dave Jakubowski. Uh, aggregate Knowledge really went in a direction where all of the focus was on providing data and analytics to the major ad agencies. And uh, John, um, John Nelson, who started Organic, one of the first agencies, is now the uh, CEO of Omnicom Digital, joined the board. And I said, look, we got to get a guy who's an ad heavy in here. And Jack Kowalski was previously the GM of Microsoft Ad Center and had a senior position at uh, Specific Media. And we brought him in, and he's just been kicking butt. Aggregate Knowledge has really, really made a significant significant contribution in the area of data and analytics for these major agencies. And he was able to bring in a crew of people, know exactly how to run that business. So you're a big fan of big data then? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. (laughs) We just had a big special yesterday on big data, mentioned about it. So uh, that's cool. We're going to get into a lot of these topics. Just kind of get the the small talk out of the way here. Um, Your current role is the founder of Bullpen Capital. Right. So Bullpen, to me, I'm a baseball nut. I love baseball. Bullpen means you go to the bullpen for relief. Yep. You got it. Close the game out, hopefully, uh, or mid-innings relief. So tell us about what Bullpen is. It's a special fund, uh, as I know from, from reading and talking to you, to target uh, uh, the expansion of this new seed and explosive new funding environment. Right. Explain the force. Right. Uh, I'll tell you how we got the name at the end, too. So here's what happened. I've, I've been investing with a lot of the so-called super angels, and that's kind of a misnomer because they really are actually, in some cases, actual small venture firms, too. I've been investing with a lot of them since they got off the ground. Uh, Josh Koppelman from First Round is one of the first investors in aggregate knowledge. Uh, Mike Maples was an early advisor to the company. I've known Jeff Clavier, who runs Softtech since he was at Reuters in the late 90s. And so I've worked with these guys, done a lot of investing. And we were, me and my buddies Duncan Davidson and Rich Melman, were sitting around over summer of 09 doing a little bit of data analysis, right? Another big data assignment. We realized that as more and more of these seed funds got created, they were creating an inventory of companies that weren't quite ready to go to the traditional venture guys, but were also difficult to bridge from just the seed guys, because the seed guys at that time didn't have really big funds. So, well, wait a minute. You've got some really good companies here. Just to clarify um, for the folks out there, 
with that. Seed funds don't traditionally have follow-on big funds, yep. like a VC firm, right? Yep. That's what you're referring to, Yeah, right? they, they tend not to have as big a reserve. So if a big fund writes you a $5 million check and you stub your toe, you can probably get some more money to get through the hardships. But a lot of the the new super angel funds are smaller funds and you get a $500,000 check and if you need another $500,000, it can frequently be very difficult because they make so many investments with smaller reserves. Yeah, and so you got Dave McClure, Clavier, Maples, right. First Round Capital, True Ventures. Um, maybe the First Round True Ventures is more traditional VC than, say, Dave McClure and Mike Maples and, and Clavier. And they're out doing some really good work out there, funding really right. good companies, spending a lot of time. Mm-hmm. I know I've seen them working their butt off. Yeah. Um, they need some air support, right? They need some cover. They need a little bullpen. Is that That's you ex- come in and say, hey, for your stars that are going to rise up? Yep. And so that's exactly right. So what happens is here's what the analysis we did turned out. Of their portfolio, 30% of their portfolios in aggregate quickly are really exciting companies. You know, and they quickly go up to a venture auction and the guys in Sand Hill Road are excited about it. About 20% of their deals, you know, they, they, they don't like too much. They're kind of just floating there. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, the entrepreneur wasn't a fit. The team didn't execute. But that left 50% of their deals in the middle, which they kind of were too early to tell. As Mike Maple sometimes says, they were in, a, in an extended learning and discovery phase. They hadn't quite figured out what their model was. Yeah, and this, the pivoting stuff's going on right now. The market's changed. It's turbulence. So right. these guys are... Right. And so you look, you look at some examples and you go, well, wait a minute. For every Zynga that goes up and to the right immediately... Go look at the stories of Chegg and ModCloth and Etsy and, quite frankly, the in-between round on Twitter. And for every one Zynga that you find that just hits it out of the park the right way, there were four to five companies that went through that hard intermediate round that it was difficult in the environment where you have only a potentially thinly capitalized seed fund in front of you to go get through that difficult point. So I said, guys, you need a bullpen. And the way we came up with the name is I'm involved in a deal with Chad Durbin, who used to pitch for the Phillies and now is a relief pitcher for the Cleveland Indians. And he was in our office and uh, we were talking about this idea. And Chad said, yeah, it's kind of like you're building a bullpen for the seed guys. I'm like, that's exactly right. That's the name we got to go with. And so fortunately, I was involved in, in, in this company called Showcase U, which is actually a cool site. It's for recruiting for college scholarships for a collegiate athletes, right? You're a high school student, you throw 80 miles an hour left-handed and you're in 10th grade, how do you figure out where the right scholarships are? So Durbin and some of the Phillies were the original investors really? in this company called Showcase U. It's actually a cool company. It has a combine workout online, basically, for high school kids. For the high school kids. And because the high school yeah. kids sometimes are in tough geographies to get to. You're in, you're in a small rural area in Nebraska. How do they find out that you're the guy who can throw 89 miles an hour? Great. So, I mean, this VC market, so basically what you're referring to with bullpen right now is, is and you've been an entrepreneur, so you live through classic, you know, classic financing, your last company financed by Kleiner Perkins and, you know, Tribe, I forget who financed Tribe. Um, um, yeah, Mayfield was the lead investor. Mayfield, again, another mm-hmm. traditional VC yep. firm, all tier one VCs, you mm-hmm. know, although Mayfield, people will argue now, has slipped a little bit, uh, so some of their key partners have, have slipped away, but they've all moved on. Mm-hmm. Um, what you're really referring to is, there's a new dynamic of entrepreneurship going on now mm-hmm. where... You know, there are some breakout companies that just need a little bit more time to mature. In the old model, they just be kind of closed down. The mm-hmm. VC guy would be on the board. Ah, this is a pain in the ass, and you know, I'm really not growing. and do another round. It's, they get kind of lazy in, in a way. If they got ten ten boards they're on. Mm-hmm. So with the super angels and and the fact that it doesn't take a lot of cash to start a company, you got more deals getting done. So the the Y Combinator, mm-hmm. the Dave McClure's and Jeff Clavier's and, and the Mike Maples and some of the sense Silicon Angle Labs, which we're doing here, I was telling you about. Right. We're funding companies. The more companies funded, the better. What you come in is you keep them alive longer. So That's they right. could pivot possibly. That's right. And so what happens is right now the venture industry is being disrupted the same way that the venture industry has funded companies that have disrupted other industries. They are being disrupted in the exact same way. And the disruption happened from below, as always happens. It started in the seed stage. Now, in order for the disruption to go all the way through, there need to be companies that come after seed stage investors that have the same philosophy and mentality. Pro-entrepreneur, easy terms, operating people who get their uh, hands dirty to get deals done. Yeah. You need that in the B stage and in the C stage. And here's what our prediction is, John. Our prediction is a few years from now, there'll be a company that comes after Bullpen that does Series C and Series D financing or mezzanine financing with the same philosophy as Bullpen. 
and then DSTs at the end of that chain. And you can imagine building companies that go all the way to liquidity, that you got money from Maples first, Bullpen second, this unnamed company third, and you went quasi-public with DST, and you've bypassed the entire venture scheme entirely. And the entire institutional public markets, complete liquidity, wealth creation, companies creating jobs. I mean, this is a new paradigm. I mean, this is an amazing, I mean, this is a potentially amazing point in the history of U.S. finance. The idea that you could go to billion dollar outcomes, bypassing not only the public markets on the backside, but the traditional venture ecosystem on the front side. I mean, that is a disruption if ever there was one. Amen. I mean, I am with you 100%. You know, there's some people who will will argue regulation. Mm -hmm. Is it market forces? First of all, I'm a big believer in market forces. So I think what you're doing is clearly identifying an opportunity. The dynamics are all lining lining up. Um, Entrepreneurs are validating it. And so, but the the questions are regulations. I mean, first of all, I'm anti-regulation. But as you start to get to that liquidity, some are arguing, and I even wrote a blog post about it saying, hey, you know, basically Facebook's public right Mm now. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you say to those guys? This is the change in the history of the financial institution. Do we want the government regulating this? Yeah. So my, my, my co-founder of uh, Bullpen, I started Bullpen with two really good guys, Duncan Davidson, who was the founder of COVAD and was Advantage Point for years. You got his ass handed to it by government regulation with COVAD. Well, I mean, we well, know what happened then because of the, the ILEC war, CLEC wars. But not only that, to some extent, COVAD doesn't exist unless the Telecom Act of 94 <laughs> happens. So True. In some ways, a, a creation of the government, too. Good point. Good so, point. So, but right. But, but think about that. The arbitrariness of government as opposed to a well thought out centralized plan so anyway so Duncan sometimes uses that phrase you know he, he talks a lot about the way in which you know the government you know the, the worst thing you can ever hear is I'm with the government I'm here to help right I mean <laughs> that's about the way it goes but his point around the 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 new quasi public markets is money will find a way yeah. And yeah. when Sarbanes-Oxley happens and it's tough to go public yeah. and you're a CEO like Pincus, who's running one of the great all-time companies in Silicon Valley at Zynga, he says, you know, going public is not an entrance. It's, it's not an exit. It's an entrance. That's his, that's his quote. Why, why, would wow. I, why, why do I need that headache? Yeah. I mean, I was just talking with uh, Charles Beeler, who sold uh, for Eldorado. He sold Compel in one of his investments to Dell for over a billion dollars. And, and, and 3PAR, and another firm, he wasn't on that one, but that was sold to HP during the storage wars. He's just talking about the lawsuits. Literally, this shakedown of the immediately filed lawsuits. You know, you could have gotten more money. So this, this, this public market's brutal. No doubt, no mm-hmm. doubt. Um, I think what you're doing is a revolution. I'm, I'm all excited about this new environment. Um, again, anything with this liquidity, wealth creation, where the engine of innovation can be powered, that's fantastic. Um, but back to startups, okay, mm-hmm. get back to where you're playing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the history of Silicon Valley was built on the notion of value add. Mm-hmm. Um, some have said over the past 10 years, venture capital has not been truly value add, mm-hmm. and some were arguing value subtract and then just money. Mm-hmm. So what you're talking about here is getting in and helping these companies stay alive. What's the value-added side of the equation? I mean, I know that a lot of these folks like like our, like ourselves here at Silicon Angle, McClure, Clavier, and Maples, and True Ventures, they roll their sleeves up, right. first-round capital. Right. They provide, but you can only provide so much. It kind of expands. Right. You guys are filling in on the capital market side. Right. How are you guys helping out on the value-add? Because a lot of those companies may be the next Twitter. Right. You've got to bridge the financing. That's right. Allow them to do the pivot or get the creative energy to, to, to grow. And they mm-hmm. hit that market. If they hit, the, hit it going vertical, mm-hmm. you've got to kind of sometimes nurture it. Do you guys have a strategy for that? Talk about the value add side. So, so let, me, let, let me give you my, my perspective on that. So I think 10 years ago when you're starting a company, the name of the venture firm was more important than potentially the partner on your board. 10 years later, the name of the firm matters much less, and it's the name of the partner, and it's the operating experience that that partner, partner brought to bear. And you go talk to the 24-year-old entrepreneur versus the 34-year-old entrepreneur. The 24-year-old entrepreneur, 24 entrepreneur wants a guy like you or a guy like me on his board. He wants a been there, done that, started a company, was a CEO, exited it, got fired, hired people, fired other people. Scar tissue, scars, knowledge, experience. Exactly. And if... if, if a good friend of mine who's in the traditional business, I'll leave his name out of it, he, he sometimes says the following phrase, the era of the gentleman VC is over. And what he means by the era of the gentleman VC is over is, you know, if your background is you were a junior associate who came in with a finance degree and an MBA and had never started a company, you're not going to get picked by the entrepreneur anymore. And 10 years from now, almost everyone in the business is going to have a resume that looks more like 
a Chris Law, a Paul Martino, a Mark Pincus, a, you name all the people who we've started our companies with. Yeah, there's a lot more entrepreneurs with track record, and certainly with, with the kind of uh, big companies in the Valley, just in our generation, Net, starting with Netscape, mm -hmm. Google, PayPal, right. uh, and now we're going to see Facebook, is, and then now Zynga. You, this ecosystem is just inter intertwined i mean mm -hmm. for every failure that spawns more success right so that's right that's the silicon valley way yeah well a tribe was tribe was a perfect example of a successful failure tribe was not a successful outcome but it was in many ways a very successful way to actually pioneer what became social networking you know investments got made into facebook as a result of that zynga and aggregate knowledge were both the outcrops of what was learned i mean to some extent the original business case of zynga was remarkably simple there is a ton of time being spent on social networks and after you get done finding your buddies and looking at photos what do you do and Pincus's original vision to some extent was let's have games to play and that insight doesn't happen that way unless you don't yeah. do tribe and go into the trenches yeah. and yeah. get the scars on your back and your and your your second venture of a, of a after, or the venture right after tribe was aggregate knowledge right. which was similar concept people are connected I mean, you got to be excited, though. I mean, you, you know, you were involved in the tribe very early on. All the stuff that you dealt with, activity streams, n news feeds, well, connections, the social you're, science. You know, one of, the, one of the nicest pieces of validation of this recently was over in uh, Q4 of 2010, seven of the patents that me, Chris Law, Elliot Lowe, and Brian Lawler wrote got issued. Now, they're all owned by Cisco. Cisco bought Tribe in the, in the end. They bought the assets in the, in the patent filings. But there are patent filings that go back to 2002 on the cornerstones and hallmarks of what social networking really is that we wrote back then that have now issued or are granted or sitting in uh, the Cisco portfolio. And while that's kind of like a consolation prize in that there wasn't a big yeah. outcome for Tribe, it is very validating to see that those original claims on really cutting edge stuff have been, have been issued. And I'm excited about that. You should be proud. And I'm proud to know you. You're a great guy. You have great uh, integrity. You're going to do well as a venture capitalist. I think you people will trust you and you're, you're fair. And there's two types of people in this world, people who help people, people who screw people people so you know you really on one side or the other you're you're not in between you're truly on the on the good side I, I really enjoy you know having chatting with you um, but let's talk about entrepreneurship from that perspective mm -hmm. talk about patents yep. um, try was an outcome that we all can relate to the what happened with Facebook and what Zuckerberg and, mm -hmm. and those guys are doing over there that's entrepreneurship so talk to the entrepreneurs out there yeah hey you know what you do some good work it all comes back to you talk about the the karma of entrepreneurship. A failure is not a bad thing. You know, it's kind of a punchline these days. Oh, failure is a stepping stone to the next thing. But talk about your experience and, and, and let's you and I talk about how to deal with failure. For those first time entrepreneurs out there in their 20s, what, just give them a, a sense of how to approach their venture. And if it fails or succeeds, what advice would you give them? Yeah, well, like winning and losing is an important part of the game. I mean, certain companies are going to be successful and certain ones aren't. And if you go and start 10 unsuccessful companies, maybe this isn't exactly the business for you. But that said, how you play the game is important as well. And if you're a high integrity guy who gets good investors and you make quality decisions, and let's say the market wasn't a fit, you're going to get the money the second time because people said, you know, I work with that guy. That guy really did a good job. You know, they never got it quite right but this is a guy who learned the right lessons. So when I'm coaching a first time CEO and I'm a CEO coach of a couple guys now, um, you know, I'm looking for someone who's sitting there going, hey, I not only want to do this to win and be successful, but I, I want to learn. I, I want to do this better than no next one, no time. No one walks in and says, I'll learn from my failure. I hope I'm successful. I mean, you gotta go and say, hey, I'm gonna be successful. I want to win. Failure is not an option, but failure happens, right? I mean, you know, it's bad breaks. That, mean. But, but here is the key lesson. And I tell this to all of the entrepreneurs I work with. You will not be successful if you're making mistakes that were made by those before you. If you make novel mistakes, you're in good company, right? And so only ever make a novel mistake. I mean, a good example is when Claw and I started, Chris Law and I started Aggregate Knowledge. Aggregate knowledge was the original business model was around recommendations and there were dead bodies in front of us. There was net perceptions, there was Firefly. And actually I was in the office this morning with Yezdi, one of the founders of Firefly. Yes, I did a podcast with him, yeah. Yeah. So predictive analytics for Yezdi. What did we do? We went out and we I flew out and met John Riedel, University of Minnesota, who was the founder of Net Perceptions. I dug up Yezdi. I got these guys on my advisory board and and while aggregate knowledge uh, was not successful in the recommendation business and pivoted into the data management thing. We made novel mistakes. We did not repeat the mistakes of net perceptions in Firefly. 
And so I think that's an important, important lesson to an entrepreneur. If you're going into an area that has dead bodies in front of you, you better research them, you better know who they are, you better know what happened, and you better make sure that if you screw it up, you at least screw it up in a way which none of us could have predicted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the only way you're going to get a hall pass on that. Well, let's talk about talk about some of the entrepreneurship activities. So, so you, you're in that sector where you're feeding the seed and the super angels in the first mm-hmm. rounds, uh, uh, early stage guys, and it's a good fit. Um, what about some of the philosophies on like um, the firms out there? There's a, there's two there's two philosophies. Mm-hmm. I was just talking to an entrepreneur here. You, you met on the way out, uh, a street a speaker text, and you know they're at seven you know under a million dollars in financing, mm-hmm. Series A. Yeah. And then you got in the news yesterday, Color forty one million dollars bill to win, right. and then you right. know Flipboard a hundred million dollars. Right. So you got this is these are guys that we know. I mean, they're yeah. our yeah. our generation, or a little bit you know around the same time, and certainly they have pedigree. Mm-hmm. So remember the old days, the arms race mentality. Right. Win the sector at all costs. Right. I and mean, that's kind of what's going on here. I mean, some of them command that kind of money. There's obviously an auction going on. What do you make of that? I mean, bubble, is it arms race? So, so Rich Melman inside of Bullpen did a fascinating analysis. He looked at the full uh, portfolio of, t- he took about 20 of the best super angels. By the way, the super angels are all different. Some are micro VCs, some are buying options, et cetera. So, so first off, super angel is a weird word, but it's everybody from Union Square and Foundry on one side to first round and floodgate. But anyway, take the top 20 or so of these guys and look at their portfolios. What's amazing about their portfolios is that unlike 10 and 20 years ago in prior tech bubbles, there are not 20 companies doing the same thing. When you categorize them, yeah, 10% are in ad tech, 10% are direct to consumer, et cetera. But like 40% are one-offs. That is, this is, I think, one of the first times in the history of venture that 40% of the deal flow is a one-off, unique business idea that there aren't 30 guys going to do. And I think that the importance of that to what happens in this next stage of the tech boom, we don't know what that means yet. Because back in the day, well, we, we need a dis- we're a venture firm. We need a disk drive company. Okay, so you're a venture firm. You've got your disk drive company. So now 20 venture firms are a disk drive that company. That also created the herd mentality everyone talks about with venture. Yep, I mean, I, I was uh, on, a, on, a, on a talk on, a, on here on the cube, and I don't think I actually put it in a blog post, but I called um, the era of entrepreneurship, like with open source and low cost mm-hmm. of entry, with cloud computing and now mobility, the manure of innovation. Where you know, <laughs> in the manure that's being out in the marketplace, mushrooms are growing out of it, right? And, right. And these, you don't know what's going to. They all look the same. In a way. So mm-hmm. how do you tell the good ones from the bad ones? So it's hard, right? So you have a lot of one. You have a lot more activity, hence angel list, hence the super angels. Right. So, so the economics and, and the deal flow are all there. The question is, how do you get them from being just a one-off, looked good on paper, flame out? To reality. Yeah. Well, look, in my opinion, seed stage investing is about investing in people. And I think when big firms try and do seed stage investing, there's an impedance mismatch a lot of times because they want more evidence. They want to know, did the market work? Did the management? Oh, this, is, this is an early stage venture. Am, am I going to want to go in a foxhole with this person? And in many ways, the good super angels are instinctive investors who are betting on people that they want to be in the foxhole with. And yeah, did they do it before? Do they know how to hire people? Is the market reasonably interesting? But guess what? They're probably going to pivot three times. So wait a minute. At the end of the day, you've got to invest in people. Later stage venture is not. You can look at discounted cash flows. You can look at mezzanine financing. You can do traditional measures. But if you're going to invest in two people who have a prototype and need $500,000, I mean, you're investing in people at that point. What do you think about the, um, the obviously angel list I'm a big fan of and, and recently was added thanks to uh, Nivy out there. But uh, even though I'm not, I don't really co-invest with anyone else other than myself. Um, <laughs> Maybe you guys with bullpen, but but it, that's a phenomenon. You now have angel list, which is opening up doors for deal flow. Companies are getting funded. Naval's getting yeah. a ton of activity. Nevi doing a great job with venture hacks. Right. You get Y Combinator, which I call the community college of startups. <laughs> they bring in like they open the door, and, they, and I mean that in actually a good way. I don't mean that negatively. I mean they're giving access to entrepreneurs that never had access to the market. Right. And now you have Paul Graham kind of giving the halo effect, or throwing the holy water on, on, on certain startups and they get magically funded. Right. Um, but yesterday they had an event and they're, they're packed. And right. I, I've heard from VC saying, I'm not invited because I didn't, wasn't part of that original investment class. So it seems that Y Combinator is getting full. Yeah. So 
Do you see that? Do you agree? Is there will there be an overflow? Y Combinator, you know, kind of like how TED Conference has, you know, TED. There'll be, you know, Y Combinator, Boston, little franchises will be like Bar Camp. Or well, sure. I mean, look and look, look at TechStars. They they franchise. They I was over there with Dave Tish in New York. There's TechStars New York. After there's TechStars Boulder and TechStars Seattle. There's no doubt in my mind that right now there is an overinvestment in the seed stage, meaning that there is a little bit of a seed bubble going on. That's not necessarily bad, though, because in terms of raw dollars, there's not a bubble yet. Um, Rory, who's over at... It's uh, frothy. It smells like a bubble. It looks like a bubble. But when you look at the mechanics... When you look at the actual total dollars, it's not a bubble. Rory, who has... Andreessen Horowitz, Ben, said that, um, that it's a boom, not a bubble. Yeah. So Don't be confused. It looks like bubbles and booms kind of look together the same. Right. I actually... I, I'm not quite sure I have the exact data right, but here's the quick summary. If you take a look at venture capital investment as a percent of GDP, historically it's been something like 0.1% of GDP. In the bubble back in 99, it went to 1%, something like it went 10x higher. Right now, we're still at 0.1%. But since it's very much centered around the seed stage investing, you see this frothiness in the seed but until that number goes from 0.1% of GDP back up to 1%, there's no real bubble because the tonnage of money hasn't come in yet. And so, so it's starting, but this is what a tech boom feels like. The early stages are excitement and lots of ideas and lots of flowers blooming. Yeah. And then the big money comes in. Because, John, I'll bet your, your brother and your sister and your mom haven't invested in a tech startup. But no. back in 99, well, they did. Well, thank God there's no public market that supports that. But in a way, that's the good and bad star veins. But, you know, there's no fraud going on. And most of the companies that are out there, whether they're lifestyle business or seed or bullpen funded, are actually generating money, income. The, the entrepreneur he, I was in here earlier, Mike, was saying that he got a business deal. So people are kind of like saw the old bubble and said, shoot, I don't want to do that again. I got to have at least revenue. Right. And so companies, you know, Zynga started out with cash. So, I mean, you know that because you invested in it. But, you know, Pincus was getting some cash flow in the door from day one. That's right. So that, he had that no company was That company was profitable the first day it started, basically. So, so talk about, um, you know, so I'm with Paul Martino, by the way, with Bullpen Capital, entrepreneur, um, wrote the patents on social networking, um, which he sold to Cisco when they sold the company, um, now with Bullpen Capital. Huge dynamic. If you're a company out there, this is exactly the, the, the positive dynamic you want to see because mainly, you know, Dave McClure, Jeff Clavier, Mike Maples have been kind of getting their butts handed to him in the press about Super Angels not having the juice to kind of go anywhere. And it's been kind of a, a negative press there. So, you know, this is the kind of uh, void that's been filled by you guys to show the market that look at this there's a, a roadmap here so even though that you know the McClure's and, and Clavius don't have big funds mm -hmm. that there's a path to follow on financing so that the VCs can't shut them down and I've heard some VCs say that so well, look, um, a lot of traditional venture guys would like to say that you know this little disruption, we nipped it in the butt and it stopped after the seed stage. But that's not the history of disruptions. The history of disruptions are they start from the bottom, then they get ecosystem support, and then they grow and then they disrupt the incumbents. And well, I disrupt. think we're halfway there. So, so the angel gate thing that Arrington reported on was interesting because, you know, essentially what happened there is there was a lot of infighting. Ron Conway uh, was not happy. He can't be happy about competition. I mean, this competition, that increases prices, right? So, you know, in the short term, prices have been inflated on valuation. Mm -hmm. True or false? Yeah, that's mm. true, but 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 I think I think the whole way AngelGate was reported was absurd. The most pro entrepreneurial venture people, perhaps in the history of the business, are the guys who were supposedly at those tables. I mean, Mike Maples, Jeff Clavier, Josh Coppola. But Ron Conway fired his guy that was there. I I understand. Suppose again, supposedly that was PR, right? These are the most pro entrepreneurial venture guys in the history of the business. So I think that turned into yeah. something that it never was. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing, you know, for content producers who want page views, they got to create some drama. Um, and, uh, you know, as you know, SiliconANGLE doesn't have any banner ads on our site. Quick plug for us. Uh, <laughs> we are motivated by content, not page views. So thanks for coming in today. Um, no, but seriously, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a black cloud over the Super Angels, and it has been since AngelGate. I've mm -hmm. heard privately from VCs that, oh, Super Angels. There's been kind of a scuttlebutt there. Yeah. Um, tr misaligned, just rumors. I, I, I completely overblown, and 
you know, their business model threatens the incumbents and, you know, someone needed, someone needed a piece of fodder to start a, yeah. you know, start a tech crunch discussion, right? There's no doubt that the market is need in need of a new ecosystem for the early stage because individual angels traditionally were wealthy individuals, mm -hmm. but now you have people with more experience like yourselves and entrepreneurs from Google and Facebook, et cetera, right. coming out and, and doing some things. Okay. So uh, next topic, more on a, on a personal kind of professional note. Okay. Last final question is, uh, uh, I know you got to run, appreciate your time. Um, you're a technologist. A lot of folks don't know that you're a hardcore computer science guy. And yep. you, our motto at Silicon Angle is computer science meets social science right in your wheelhouse. So with that, just kind of final parting question. Um, what gets you excited technically right now? I mean, obviously you have roots in both comp sci and social. You're on Zynga's uh, early investor roster. You've got a bullpen capital. You're looking at a lot of deals. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, you as a computer scientist, geek, mm -hmm. what gets you jazz? What do you see in the horizon that's not yet on the mega trend roster that kind of you can't put your finger on it truly, but right. you really get a good feeling. Well, so I think you'll be disappointed with this answer because I think it's now crossed the chasm to start being one of those mega trends. It's called consumerization of enterprise, and that's now the buzzword for it. But what does it really mean, and why do I think it's for real? Look, you've got cool self-service applications for everything. You can go do home banking by logging into a portal. You can go to an ATM. You can go do these things. But, you know, go bring a new laptop into your big stodgy Fortune 500 company and, you you know, it's like getting a rectal exam, right? You know, we got to install this. We got to give you this private key. We gotta, it's TSA. It, it, right. It's like going through TSA. It's, exactly. So the idea that IT inside of big Fortune 500 companies is going to stop being this gatekeeper to new technology. I mean, look, how long do you think it'll be until pick your favorite Fortune 500 company, the IT people know how to deal with the iPad 2? But how many people bought an iPad 2 into the office already? Everyone. And so <laughs> this, to me, is going to be the big next decade. The next decade are going to be self-service offerings for the enterprise getting around the, a very frustrating gatekeepers inside of, you know, the IT department, et cetera. And that's going to lead to an awesome boom of everything from security to auditing to compliance, et cetera. That's the Convergence Equation. Paul Martino, my friend, entrepreneur, great guy, venture capitalist now, uh, on the good side, helping the seed, super angel, micro VCs. Great to have you. Consumerization of IT, that hits the cloud, mobile, social, hits everything. So. Okay. That, I was buzzword compliant on that. Great job. Great to have you. I know you're busy. Got to have you in again. Thanks so much for your time. That's a wrap. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, John.